from around the globe. It's the Cube with digital coverage of AWS Public Sector Online. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services. Hello, and welcome back to the Cube's coverage of AWS Public Sector Summit Online. I'm John Furrier, your host of the Cube. I wish we could be there in person, but we're doing remote because of the COVID and the pandemic. We've got a great guest, Paul Grist, worldwide public sector head of education international for AWS. Paul, thank you for coming on remotely. Great to be here, John. Uh, there's a lot of disruption in the education space this year with university schools still uncertain about what the future will look like. What are some of the biggest trends you're seeing? John, what we've seen is uh, the rapid adoption of technology and the growth of flexible online learning, learning that can take place anytime, anywhere. What we've seen is universities, national education systems and schools rapidly migrating systems and content to the cloud, spinning up new applications. Uh, and, in, and we've seen companies that provide technology and content and platforms, uh, the ed techs and publishers of the world, uh, increasing their capacity, increasing their capability to deliver new applications to, to education. What are some of this research uh, that you're finding uh, out there? Yeah, um, you know, a time of uh, much change and, and um, uh, things happening very, very fast. So we, we responded fast to, to the changes, John. Um, got a load of customer conversations together looking at speeches by educationalists who are responding to the changes at some of the online events that spun up very quickly at places like the University of Buckingham, ASU, GSV, Inside Higher Education, places like Blackboard World, and really just uh, talk to those leaders about their responses to the change, what kinds of things they were doing, um, and brought that together into the research. It's underpinned by some in-depth in research and insights from um, education reports and articles too. Thanks, Paul, really appreciate it. Having that research is critical. I know you guys do a lot of work on that. Um, I know you got some news. Take a quick plug for the new research that's coming out, you guys just put out today. Just take a minute to quickly explain uh, what, what it's about and how to find it. Uh, we're publishing today uh, some new research that shows there's seven key emerging trends uh, in this new world of education. Check it out on the AWS website. Uh, two key trends, flexible learning and uh, the new world of employability. So you guys got a lot of data, it's great about Amazon, I got a lot of customers, good to see you guys getting that research. The question I have for you, Paul, is um, what amount of the research um, shows really the COVID situation? Because there's before COVID, there's kind of during, and then there's going to be a post-COVID mode. Um, was that prior research in place with COVID or after COVID? Can you share kind of the update on the relevance yeah, of the research? Yeah, I, I think the, the sector has changed. Um, the sector has gone through the fastest change it's ever gone through. Um, and undoubtedly, uh, most of the issues, uh, most of the challenges and opportunities in the sector predate the pandemic. But what we've seen is COVID accelerate uh, many of the challenges and, and the opportunities, but also uh, bring new uh, opportunities. You know, one of the things we've seen with education is the disruption, the forcing function with COVID. Uh, there's a problem, we all know what it is, and it's important. There's consequences um, for those, and as you can quantify the disruption with real business value and certainly student impact. Uh, there's been downsides with remote education, um, more teacher parent involvement, and students having to deal with isolation, less social interaction. How do you guys see that? What is Amazon doing to solve these problems? Can you talk about that? Yeah, I think um, you know education is very much a, a, a people business, um, and uh, what we've been trying to do is partner with organisations to ensure that uh, the the uh, the people are kept at the centre uh, of, of of the business. So, working with organisations uh, such as um, uh, LSA, sorry, Los Angeles United School District in the US to spin up a call centre to allow students to contact uh, their tutors uh, um, and parents to interact with tutors to get questions answered. So what are the challenges these academic institutions are facing is speed, is pace of change. Um, what's going on with competition? How are they competing? How are university and colleges staying relevant? Obviously there's a financial crisis involved. There's also the actual delivery aspect of it. Um, more and more mergers, uh, you're starting to see ecosystem changes. Can you talk about what's going on in the educational ecosystem? Yeah, I mean, net net education institutions are being forced to rethink their business models. Um, uh, 
It's an international marketplace in higher education. Um, it's been a growing marketplace for many, many years. That suddenly stopped overnight. So every university has had to rethink about uh, where their revenues are coming from, where the students are coming from. There's been some surprises too. I mean, in the UK, um, actually international enrollments are up uh, post COVID because one of the strange side effects of COVID is um, without being able to travel, there's actually a cost saving for students. And so we've seen, you know, universities in, in the UK benefit from students who, who, who want to study, uh, perhaps travel and, and the cost of study was too high previously, now being able to study remotely. It's an un unexpected and unintended consequence, um, but it kind of shows how um, there are opportunities for all organizations uh, during this time. Many countries had to cancel exams altogether this year, which has been a big, huge problem. I mean, people are outraged and people want to learn. It's been, it's a, you know, the silver lining in all this is that you have the internet, and you have the cloud. Um, I want to get your thoughts. How are universities and schools dealing with this challenge? Because, you know, you have a multi-sided marketplace. You've got the institutions, you've got the students, you've got the educators. They all have to be successful. How are universities dealing with this challenge? Yeah, I think, you know, teaching and learning has been online for 20, 30 years. And I think a lot of organizations have, have adopted uh, online teaching and learning. But I think assessment is the one big area of education um, that remains to be uh, made available at scale, at low cost. So most assessment is still uh, pen and paper based. There's big trust and identity issues. And what we're seeing uh, through this COVID change is organizations really getting to grip with, with both of those issues. So having the confidence to put assessment online to make it available at scale, and then also having the confidence to tackle uh, trust and identity questions. So who is taking the exam? Where are they sitting? Can we be sure that it's actually that person taking that exam? So, you know, the rise of things like proctor proctoring technologies, um, giving organizations the opportunity to, to assess remotely how has this crisis affected research at academic institutions? Because um, you know, certainly we know that if you need a lab or something, certainly we're seeing students need to be physically in person, but with remote and all this changes going on with the scale and the pace of change, how has research at academic institutions been impacted? Yeah, I mean, research has always been a, a really collaborative activity, but we've seen that collaboration increase. It's had to increase. Uh, researchers have had to go remote, many of them work in labs, they haven't been able to do that. They've needed to spin up applications and new technologies in the cloud to continue working. But what we're seeing is, you know, governments taking an increased uh, interest in the research being applicable, um, making sure that it leads to innovation, which is meaningful, uh, getting much more involved and insisting uh, that the research is made available now. And of course, that's, there's no place that that's clearer uh, than in health research and trying to find the cures for COVID. And then secondly, we're seeing that research is becoming much more collaborative, not just across institutions, but also countries. So one of the great projects we're involved in at the moment is with the University of Adelaide, who are collaborating with researchers from um, the Breeding and Acclimatization Institute in Poland on a project to study the increase uh, in uh, crop yield of wheat. You know, one of the things that's coming out of this, whether it's research or students, is open online courses, virtual uh, capabilities, um, but a concept called stackable learning. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, we're in a, we're in a global marketplace in education and there's increased competition uh, between universities and education providers to make new types of certificates and online badges available. Um, we know that, um, uh, employers are looking for ever more agile methods uh, of skilling and upskilling. Um, and stackable learning is a concept that's been around for a couple of decades now, um, where learning is broken down into smaller chunks, um, put together in a, in a more personalized way from a number of different providers, um, spun up very, very quickly uh, to respond to need, um, and then delivered to students. We're seeing um, some, of the, some of the big MOOC providers like EDX and Coursera, who again have been around for over a decade, become really prominent in the um, provision of some of these stackable credentials. Their systems run on the cloud, they're easy to access. Uh, in many, many cases, they're free. Uh, and we're seeing in, uh, an increasing number of employers and education institutions in adopt and embed these types of delivery systems into their curriculum. 
totally, totally fan of Stackable Learn. It's called the Lego model, whatever you want to call it. But also online brings the nonlinear progressions. The role of data yep. is super important. So I'm very bullish on education being disrupted by uh, cloud providers and new apps. So, you know, I wanna, wanted to call that out because I think it's super important. Um, let me get to uh, a really important piece that it has to be addressed. And I want to get your thoughts on cybersecurity. Okay, cyber attacks and privacy of students are two areas that are super important for institutions to address. What's your reaction to that? Yeah, I mean, the use of more technology uh, becomes, um, you know, again, a target for, for, for cyber attack. And unfortunately, it's an increasing phenomenon. Um, simply put, every organization needs to put um, security first, uh, needs to operate as a secure, security first organization. They need to adopt technologies, uh, people and processes uh, that uh, can protect their investments. Um, and work with you know, data management vendors, cloud vendors who've got the compliances and the common privacy and security frameworks such as GD GDPR in place uh, to make sure that they provide secure services. AWS's security offerings include auditing, uh, login identity management, data encryption capabilities that offer more transparency, transparency and control to allow institutions to protect, to protect student data. Super important, thanks for sharing. What's final, what's the steps institutions can take to close the digital divide? Because now um, some people are taking gap years, research is changing, people might not even have PCs or internet connections. Um, there's still, this exposes the haves and have nots. What steps uh, can institutions take to do their part? Yeah, digital learning is here to stay, John. Um, many, we've learned that you know, many learners do not ac have access to technology. For, uh, necessary for online learning, whether those are devices or a reliable internet connection. But again, you know, governments, states, educational authorities have all turned their attention um, to these issues over the last few months. And we're seeing uh, organizations partner with um, uh, technology providers that can provide internet connections, uh, partners in AWS such as Kajit, who've installed hotspot devices on buses to deploy in areas with no connectivity. You know, whether that's a place like Denver, Colorado, uh, or whether it's a place, uh, you know, um, in Nigeria and Africa. Uh, remote connection remains a problem everywhere. Uh, and we're seeing everybody addressing that issue now. Paul, great to have you on theCUBE and, and share your insights, what's going on in international education. Uh, final question for you, in your own words, why is this year's AWS Public Sector Summit Online important? What's the most important story that people should walk away in this educational industry? The most important story, John, is that it's a time of incredible change, but also incredible opportunity. And we're seeing organizations who um, have wanted to change, who've wanted to deliver more to their students, who want to deliver a greater experience, who want to access more students and have much greater reach. Now with the appetite uh, to do that, uh, reInvent is a, is a great opportunity to work with AWS to understand what's going on with our partners, with our customers, uh, for some of the, and look at some of the, the common solutions for the challenges that they're looking to, to solve. Paul Grist, thank you for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate it. Worldwide Head of Education for International AWS. Thank you for sharing. Thanks, John. Great to be here. Okay, this is theCUBE's coverage of AWS Public Sector Online Summit, remote, virtual. This is theCUBE virtual. I'm John Furrier, your host. Thanks for watching.